percentage of total names and levels to the sources roughly agree for both male and female names. It is extremely unlikely that the four authors of the Gospels would have had the foresight, let alone the ability, to write fictional narratives that so accurately, yet subtly, reflect their historical settings. The best explanation for this data is that the writers preserved the names of the actual historical individuals involved in the actual historical events described by the Gospels. With so much evidence of the author's meticulous attention to detail, we have good reason to think that the Gospels can be trusted to provide us with at least a generally reliable portrait of the historical words and actions of Jesus of Nazareth. And like I said, there's so much more corroboration that what was written in the Gospels was generally reliable, and I would say more than that. But I don't have time to go into all of those, and I will give some resources and books that you can read if you're wanting to go deeper. I just want to finish off with a few more facts about the Bible before I go on to the resurrection evidence. The Bible is unlike any other holy books. It's not just one individual claiming that he heard from God. It's a collection of books. It was written on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, written in three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and some Aramaic. It was written by over 40 authors from multiple walks of life, kings, fishermen, historians, tax collectors, who give us a total of 66 volumes, written over a period of 1,500 years. All of this came together in order to give us the Bible, which has, amazingly, a coherent narrative running throughout all of the volumes. And in my opinion, this actually adds to the credibility of the Bible. So, let's move on to the evidence for the resurrection. If the resurrection truly happened, it was God's confirmation that Jesus was who he claimed to be, and it is assurance to Christians that they have been forgiven, and that they are saved. Now, let's go over four different points. First is that Jesus' death and burial. Is it a fact or is it fiction? Now, contemporary historians are virtually unanimous in their acceptance of Jesus' death on the cross. His death is not only mentioned a multitude of times in the New Testament, but also in non Christian historical documents of Testus. Josephus. Also, if you think about it, it is extremely unlikely that the early Christians would have invented the story that their savior was killed in a humiliating death. In the mind of a first century Jew, the idea that their Messiah would have been crucified was unthinkable, so there was no incentive make up this story, since most people wouldn't have believed it. You are left to think that the only plausible reason the story is told this way is because Jesus actually died by crucifixion. And if you accept this position, that Jesus did die, then we must ask what happened after his death and burial. That leads us to the empty tomb. The strongest piece of evidence in favor of the historicity of the empty tomb is the report that it was discovered by women. You might be confused by that if you've never heard this argument before, but if you bring into context the culture of first century Israel, you'll find that the 
testimony of women was extremely low and not given much credence at all. So if the early Christians were inventing narratives to support their own version of events, why not ascribe the discovery of the empty tomb to men or to one of the disciples who would have been received as more credible? Another factor supporting the empty tomb is the fact that Jesus' apostles began preaching the resurrection just a couple weeks after Jesus' death. If he hadn't have been raised and was still, in fact, in the tomb, it's pretty hard to imagine the Christian movement taking off if Jesus' body was still in the tomb just a walking distance away from the temple. It would have been very easy to discredit their preaching if the tomb was not empty. They could have simply just visited it and shown the body to the people if necessary. Additionally, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew writes that the Jewish leaders of his day insisted that Jesus' body had been stolen by the disciples. But if you think carefully, you'll see that this accusation implies that the Jewish leaders believed that the tomb was actually empty. They would not have accused the disciples of stealing Jesus' body if his body were still in the tomb. Now you could say to that, well, couldn't the disciples have stolen the body? This leads us to the next point, the belief of the apostles. It is nearly accepted by all historians that the disciples genuinely believed that they had encountered the risen Jesus, even if they were mistaken in their belief. We can know that they genuinely believed in the resurrection because they were willing to die for that belief. What would their motivation have been if they knew for certain that they had invented the resurrection stories? Especially since they were willing to die for this belief. We know that all but one of the apostles were martyred and killed for preaching what they preached. And they were not willing to give up their beliefs all the way to the end. A parallel to this story is actually the terrorists of 9-11. We can tell from their actions that they were indeed sincere in their beliefs. Obviously, we know that they wouldn't have done what they did if their beliefs were wrong, or rather if they knew their beliefs were wrong. But I'm going to quote Neil Shinvi again here. Unlike the terrorists, the apostles were in a position to know with complete certainty whether their claims were true. They were claiming to have seen, touched, and conversed with a man who had been executed just days earlier. If they had intentionally invented that claim, they would have known for certain that it was not worth dying for. <clears throat> On to the fourth point, which is similar to the third. It is the conversion of Paul. Some of you might already be familiar, but Paul, originally named Saul, was a vehement opponent to the church and traveled around Israel persecuting the early church. In Acts 8.3, it says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. And in Acts 9, verses 1 through 2, it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from, from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. But on his way to Damascus to continue his persecution, 
whatsoever to claim to see Jesus alive, and every reason to deny the resurrection if it weren't true. But we have significant testimony to consider that demonstrates that he really did see Jesus alive. Paul underwent a complete religious transformation in a matter of days. He went from regarding Jesus as a false prophet was the Messiah who alone offered salvation to all people. And just like the other apostles, he underwent horrific beatings and imprisonments for his beliefs. As a conclusion for the evidence for the resurrection, I want to quote the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 13. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. <laughs> now let's move on to the trilemma. A lot of you have probably heard of C.S. Lewis, and in his book Mere Christianity, this is where he about the trilemma, and I'm going to read it for you. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I am ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was, and is, the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him, and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. End quote. So if Jesus was just a mere man and made the claims about his deity, knowing they were false claims, that would make him a liar, and thus he would no longer be a good moral teacher. So taking into consideration the arguments laid out for the reliability of the Bible, and the resurrection, and several other arguments that I have not expressed in this video, I chose to believe in Christ. If someone truly rises from the dead, it's probably the most wise thing to 